came really um, with the concept of building the Center for Translational Medicine, which um, sole purpose really in my mind was to quickly push towards um, therapeutic development for active degeneration. So, you know, and Randy Olson and I talked a lot before I came because I think what we're trying to do here is pretty unique. And maybe next time I'll put a few slides together and really show you um, what we're doing. But we're now a group of about 45 people. Um, had a monstrous partnership with Allergan for the last three years. Like I was just telling Eileen, that kind of fell apart um, when they were purchased last August. So we've been out looking for a new partner. Um, so we're talking with Biogen and we're talking pretty seriously with Regeneron. So. And these are big, um, this was the Regeneron deal is about an $80 million arrangement. So, so it's a lot of fun. Um, but today, you know, my task is to really walk you guys through um, kind of structure function pathology of, of the toroid RPE vitreous retina interface. So if you're bored, you know, a lot of this is just kind of didactic. We can talk about anything you guys would like to talk about, um, so I can take it in any direction. And I, it'd be two parts. Um, I think I give the second lecture in early May. So, um, but what I'd like to do today is I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of ocular retinal development because it's it's always helped me understand the structure of the eye much better if I look at it from a developmental perspective. We'll talk about. Sorry about topographical features um, of the retina itself um, and actually the back of the eye. You know, there's a lot of topology that I think you don't think of from one region to the next. There's no good way to talk about the retina, so I like to kind of talk about the outer retina, the avascular piece, and I like to talk about the inner retina, the vascularized piece. And we'll probably end, maybe we'll get through the inner retina today, and then next week we'll talk about Brooks membrane, the choroid, and the vitreous. And I'll kind of use macular degeneration just because I'm familiar with it. And we can talk about some of the age-related changes that occur. So before we start, and I mean you may have seen this, so don't say anything if you have. But tell me about this retina. Retinal pigmented epithelium, right? Choroid. Does choroid look good, bad, indifferent? It looks bad. It looks, there's all these. I don't know. I guess those vessels look a little enlarged. These? Yeah. Okay, they're actually pretty normal. That's, that's choreo capillaris, and these are the mid sized arterioles and veins. RPE looks great to me. What about the retina? The layers just don't look. Don't look normal? Yeah. Okay. Eileen, no guesses? I feel like I remember Why are the layers not normal? that uh, we we're in the phobia. Okay. Is it just like. So there's not much to it? No, so Eileen's absolutely right. It's the dead center phobia, so it's perfectly normal. So um, that just gives me a little understanding of where we should head today. So. Um, so if I think about um, ocular development, the, the retina really forms, actually the whole eye, but the retina is kind of the crux of the ocular development. It really fo forms as these outpocketings of the diencephalon, right? And, you know, it's, it's a really simple way to kind of think about, about eye structure from my perspective. These are some pictures I took years ago. But here's this epithelium of the diencephalon out pocketing and then it's almost like you know you pushed your finger in here and two layers of that epithelium fold back on itself okay and if you keep 
keep kind of that structure in mind. It, it always helps me apical basal, right? So this is the basal surface of the epithelium. This is the apical surface of the epithelium. And when the retina and RPE, this fold will become actually the RPE in the neural retina, okay? And same picture, this is a hamster, but same idea. That original fold of the diencephalon comes out and folds back on itself. This layer becomes the retinal pigment of epithelium. This layer differentiates into the retina. I mean, it fascinates me that one layer remains as a cuboidal epithelium throughout life, and the other layer uh, differentiates to such a large extent. So you can basically build an eye from that simple outpocketing. Of course, the, the lens is actually an in-pocketing of the surface ectoderm, and so that's why it's round and why you have a capsular bag, right? The basal surface is on the outside, uh, which gives you a nice structure for, for transfer, for putting in a new lens. So if you think about that, you know, this becomes the vitreous, the tip of this outpocketing or this folding on itself becomes the iris. Um, and it's, it's, I think, a very simple way to kind of keep track of things. The neural retina itself, I think you're all familiar, goes through, over time, um, goes through a differentiation. Uh, the earliest cells that are born in the retina are the ganglion cells down in here, and probably the last cells that form are really the rock foot receptor cells. So a very uh, logical process of development. These are some human eyes that we uh, took photos of up in our lab, but you can see at this very early stage, about 10 weeks, you can see all the mitotic activity going on in this retina. You can kind of see over time the birth of this ganglion cell layer. Um, and you can see a little bit going on here with kind of differentiation of the two outer nuclear layers. But so again, you know, today we'll talk about kind of the, the neural retina comprised of, of course, neurons, uh, blood vessels, and glial cells. I'll talk specifically about the RPE. Um, and it's really this retina that, of course, subserves this linear flow of information from light striking the photoreceptors um, to their ultimate uh, transfer to, to the brain through the ganglion cell layer. Again, you know, retinal histology can be really, really complicated, but you can break it down and really think about there are really three tiers of cells, right? And those make up the nine or ten layers that we talk about. And I remember, you know, when I first started, it was very confusing to look at this and try to put it all together. But just kind of focus on these three layers of cell bodies, right? So the outermost layer, photoreceptor nuclei, makes up the outer nuclear layer, if you will. Um, inner layer is the ganglion cell layer. Um, and then in the middle are typically, there are a lot of cells, but they're bipolar cells, uh, and then all the crosstalk cells, the anacrons, the horizontals. Um, but I like to kind of think about this, and you can always get back to your layers if you really kind of think about three tiers of cells. So topographical differences, the one that you're probably most interested in is clinicians would be um, the, the topography changes that occur in the macula, right? Um, very important region of the eye, very unique to primates, um, subserves really your, your ability to see fine detail and saturated color vision, which we don't talk about. Um, again, topographical differences, and it's, I think, I mean, caught this one dead on, right? The, the dead center of the macula, the fovea, um, doesn't have internuclear layer or ganglion cell layer. So I like to talk kind of about um, uh, anatomical phobias and anatomical maculas. Some people like to talk about functional phobias and functional maculas. But quite simply, the macula is about 5.5 millimeters to 6 millimeters in diameter, centered on the fovea. Uh, and you can really define the anatomical uh, macula by the density of the ganglion cell layer. So, so everywhere the ganglion cell layer is more than one cell thick, that defines the macula. And as you get out further periphery, uh, the ganglion cell layer goes into one or two layers. Okay? 
dead center anatomic fovea, about 1.5 millimeters in diameter, is really the region that contains only photoreceptors and, of course, glial cells. But this region from about here to here, uh, anatomic fovea. Foveola um, is really a subsection where there are absolutely no rod photoreceptors. You can see red here is rod, green is cone, um, and you can see a few rods here. So this dead center region, about a third of a millimeter in diameter, is, is your uh, foveola. And of course, the, you know, so one very striking um, characteristic of the macula is the sequestration of these pigments that Paul Bernstein has, has spent a lifetime on. Um, highly sequestered uh, as uh, lutein and zeaxanthin uh, in the macular region. And, you know, uh, grossly, if you look in, especially in young people, you'll see that bright yellow um, accumulation of pigment called the macula lutea. Uh, actually located, most of that material is located in the fibers, the axons of the cone photoreceptors in the, in the macula. So if you're a cone photoreceptor in the dead center fovea, you have these really long axons that push out laterally, right? Because you, uh, your whole macula is designed for um, really being highly sensitive and you don't want those axons in your way. But for some reason that, that we don't quite understand, there's sequestration of these. Um, these pigments, the xanthophils, the carotenoids, mostly uh, molecules that you can't make yourself. So they come primarily from diet. We think their primary role is an antioxidant, and probably they absorb shortwave blue light for some reason. And Paul, I'm sure, will, will talk extensively to you about that. So again, no great way to divide up the retina, but let's let's kind of break it down into the outer retinal complex comprised of, of RPE uh, photoreceptor cells. This whole area is avascular, right? So from the synapses sitting right here, uh, this whole layer, the photoreceptor layer, um, avascular, so it receives all of its nutrients from primarily from the choroid. We'll come back. Inner retinal complex, if you will. I like to define it by the region that's the other two layers. It's vascularized um, and it's very complicated. So here's your here's your fovea again. This is actually from a monkey, and you can see um, very nicely all the features we've just talked about. I wouldn't be surprised if you come up against some of this in the future. Um, so what are those like? Um on the inner surface, those empty spaces. The cystic spaces? Yeah. Probably just, um, sorry about that, probably just the in feet, Mueller cell in feet, the um, cystic changes in those in feet, and probably a little bit due to just fixation. Oh. Right. But beautiful structure. I mean, you can really see this, this macula is exquisite, choriocapillaris. Here's your intermediate vascular layers, photoreceptors, of course, you can actually see these axons in the Henle's layer. And you won't see Henle's layer anywhere but the macula. So it, it also helps you if you have this really uh, thick layer, you know that you're in the macula. And the same in an OCT. You can actually really know where you are in an OCT. If you're in dead center phobia, it's, it's apparent. But you can use that diagnostically to really know where you are. So, outer retina, um, photoreceptors, two classes, of course, rods and cones, um, and they're highly polarized cells with their synapses in the outer synaptic layer, and we'll come back and talk about more details, um, and the tips very much integrated with the retinal pigment epithelium. Um, incredible structure, incredible requirement for oxygen, um, highest oxygen use in the entire body. Um, and there's a, actually a huge surplus of oxygen in the choroid. Um, we're not quite sure why it's, it's that high, because even the photoreceptors can't use all the oxygen that's there. Um, but a terrible environment, okay? And we'll come back when we talk about the RPD. This whole complex, because of the high amounts of oxygen, the tremendous amount of lipid turnover, 
Uh, the fact that the RPE cells don't replace themselves, so you're, you get what you get when you're born. Um, but this whole interface is, is a hugely caustic environment, and that's, it's at the crux of a lot of the disease that you see. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that in, as we move through. Rod photoreceptor system, um, basically one type of rod, maybe, a, maybe two types of rods. You have about 120 million uh, rods in your retina. Um, of course, the entire rod system is achromatic, um, really meant to, to work in dim light. Um, photoreceptors are really sensitive. They can respond to uh, a single photon of light but then they distribute that signal out to, so lots and lots of rods are connected to a single bipolar So, So highly sensitive, but the signal's damped out, and that's why um, the vision from rods is not very acute, okay? Um, Talks you a lot at night, but not acute. Cones, six million, most are concentrated in the macular region. Um, photopic system, really, very low sensitivity, but very dense packing, especially in the foveola. Uh, very responsive, one cone per one both bipolar cell, and this is where you really get that fine acuity uh, in the macula. Um, cone photoreceptors, three classes. Um, I like to talk about L, M, and S cones, and it just really refers to their, their function and the wavelength of lights that they interpret. And again, you know, pathologically, um, almost all the cone nuclei sit on the outermost level of the outer nuclear there. And it's always a good thing to remember, especially if you're diagnosing a disease based on histology, right? So retinitis pigmentosa, very often all you end up with in that disease is a single row of cone nuclei and very diagnostic. Of course, lots of topography differences in the cones, especially again in the macular region. I think um, most apparent is this, this really densely packed um, set of cone photoreceptors in the macula. I have a very strong feeling that these macular cones are actually very different um, than the cones throughout the body. You can see as you move out from the macula in any direction, uh, the cone uh, inner segments become much larger in diameter as, as compared to these these foveal cone photoreceptors. So very dense packing in the dead center fovea, highly sensitive, subserves your ability to see uh, fine acuity detail. So photoreceptor cells again, highly polarized cells, um, basically an outer segment. This is where all the action occurs, of course in the phototransduction cascade. Um, so outer segment really connected to the rest of the cell with the cilium. Um, these, these cilia are turning out to be really important regulators of communication between the cell body and the outer segment, probably far more than we knew. Um, inner segment region just packed, especially the cones, packed with, with um, uh, mitochondria, lots and lots of energetic need um, in this region. And then, of course, at the, at the proximal end of the photoreceptor are the synapses, which transfer everything that happens out here down to the bipolar cells, to the endocrine cells. So very different structure between rods and cones. We typically, um, these disc membranes in rod photoreceptors are independent. They're actually ensheathed by an outer membrane, so you can kind of think about these as stacks of coins. Uh, very different than the cone photoreceptors, which the, the disc membranes are contiguous with the, with the outer membrane. Uh, we actually know, we don't know very much about cone function if you think about it in humans. Um, and it always baffles me but very striking. Um, you can see just how, how beautiful these discs are. But some numbers, um, you know, these discs are added to the base of, of the outer segment on a daily basis. Um, 
there's about 600 to 1,000 discs per stack or make per day in a rod photoreceptor. Um, and then these, these discs actually migrate distally to the tip of the outer segment where they're eventually sphagnosotosed and shed. And, you know, I don't know if you guys have met Dean Bach. He's a good friend. He's been, been out here quite a bit. Um, but he actually did these experiments uh, initially to show that uh, with tritiated leucine that you saw a lot incorporated into these new discs. And over time, that band of tritiated leucine moved until the day it was shed. And I, Dean tells a great story about the last frog, because he predicted that it would take about 10 days before this event would happen. And this frog was dying from radioisotope exposure. He gave it so much. So he was taken home and <laughs> until you know, that 10th day where he actually showed that this uh, really happens. So the, the point is, um, it's really the damage to all the lipids that needs the lipids need to be turned over. Um, but we think there's actually um, reuse of some of the proteins like rhodopsin, and that, that's an uh, interesting concept. But uh, the rod then stays the same length throughout life, pretty much. So just some facts that I think are kind of cool. So you have 120, 125 million rods. Uh, in your ret in each of your retinas, um, a single RPE cell attends to about 200 photoreceptors. Changes a little bit with topography, um, but you're really shedding about 375 meters of outer segments per per day. Um, and if I calculate it this way, it's about 10, or 10 million meters of disc by the time you reach 75. So the point is just massive energetic requirements by this retina. Um, and I think these are, these are just fascinating numbers. When we talk about the RPE, the RPE has to manage all of this. So it's amazing. It's not surprising that there are a lot of diseases that are caused by <coughs> dysfunction of the RPE. Um, and another, another number, 9 million opsin molecules are synthesized every second. So it's, it's pretty incredible system. Again, you can see the cones incorporate that band of tritiated leucine, um, and it moves distally. The cones, um, we, don't, we don't know a lot about how the opsin is turned over in the cone outer segments, um, but we talk about kind of molecular replacement of opsin in these cone photoreceptors. There's a single paper that was published years and years ago that says, at least in humans, that cones do shed. Uh, cone outer segments are much shorter. Uh, and the RPE really have to reach down a long ways uh, to find the tips of those bones. And this whole process of uh, um, outer segment phagocytosis by the RPE has really been worked out over the last three or four years. So we know a lot about the receptors that actually recognize uh, and pinch off this, this set of discs. And it's a very standardized process about the same number of discs are, are shed every day. Um, and you can see that in some of these photos that we've taken in the lab. So it's a very interesting process where these packets are actually pinched off. Um, we think there's a lot of um, recirculation, especially of rhodops and rhodopsin, um, and then probably redistributed back to that photoreceptor. And of course, you get lectures on phototransduction. I'm sure is that Wolfgang probably. Um, I don't know if you've had those yet. But the, the real function of photoreceptors is phototransduction, right? To take those electrical or those light signals and turn them into electrical impulses that are trans transferred to the brain and, and vision is interpreted. So my favorite cell, the retinal pigmented epithelium, again. Really, quite a cell, uh, highly cuboidal in nature, extremely polarized cell. If you think about what this cell has to do, it has to get rid of waste products from the photoreceptors. It has to transfer all kinds of oxygen and other molecules um, from from the choroidal vasculature. It's non-dividing, like I said. Um, the pseudopodia on one end serve a very important function, of course, probably in retinal adhesion, but, but also in the sphagocytosis. Uh, these basal end foldings become 
really important. They increase the surface area a uh, million fold compared to if that epithelium was flat. In a lot of age related diseases, those basal microvilli are lost for reasons we don't completely understand. Function, of course, the primary function is, is to the visual cycle to turn over uh, trans retinol and to keep it circulating back to the photoreceptor segments. And again, I think Wolfgang will talk to you about that in, in detail. Uh, tremendous functions again, trans epithelial uh, transfer of uh, metabolites and waste products going in both directions. This cell has to decide whether to traffic proteins to one side, the other side, both sides. Um, fascinating. Serves really as the outer retinal uh, blood retinal barrier, okay, and, and that's subserved by these tight junctions that occur between cells. So really doesn't allow um, uh, extracellular transport of materials between cells uh, until, of course, they become pathological. And visual cycle is really a fascinating um, system, but, but basically what you're doing is 11 cis retinal is being turned into all trans retinal once light hits rhodopsin, of course. Um, and then that's converted to 11 cis retinol and re isomerized by the retinal pigment epithelium and then served back as, as all trans retinol, or actually 11 cis retinol uh, to the photoreceptor cells. And that's, that's the visual cycle. It's really a pretty straightforward system. Um, the proteins that mediate that, of course, Wolfgang has been deeply involved in, in that in identifying a lot of these proteins that modulate um, the visual cycle and uh, he's done some fantastic work. My sole contribution was we actually um, sequenced the LRAT gene which was this isomal hydrolase that had been hypothesized to exist for a long time and we discovered about 10 years ago that there really was a protein and I identified it as, as LRAT. Okay, again, you know, the junctions between RPE cells, um, probably most important are these tight junctions that really form a band between adjacent cells, and they really do um, make or create that blood ret outer blood retinal barrier. Inner blood retinal barrier, of course, would be the endothelial cells of the, of the retinal vascular. And you can see that in this in this slide, uh, just just fluorescein actually. So it was a fluorescein injection, but you can see how well that RPE blocks the egress of fluorescein from the choroid uh, into the retina. And then these, of course, would be uh, the blood retinal barrier in the in the inner retina, subserved by the vascular uh, endothelium. Lots and lots of age-related, disease-related changes in the RPE. Um, certainly, we talk a lot about an accumulation of, of lipofusion, probably true in normal aging, but uh, I think probably less true in, in once you develop macular degeneration. Um, clearly, cell density of the RPE changes in aging, it changes in all kinds of diseases. Normal aging, we've calculated once that you lose about 10 to 20 percent of your RPE. Macular degeneration, somewhere about 30 or 40 to the point that the RPE really can't maintain its integrity. And, so, um, and that's a lot of what you see in geographic atrophy. When it finally gives up the ghost, it gives up the ghost. Lots of thinning. This is, these are actually both taken from the macula uh, in about a 15-year-old and an 80-year-old. So tremendous changes uh, in the RPE. And again, accumulation of lipofusion does increase with age. And of course, you guys use lipofusion to detect disease, and that is really the basis for fungus autofluorescence imaging. Other disease-related changes that you might be less familiar with, this is the basal surface of an RP. This is Brooks membrane. Um, but there are a lot of changes in the basal lamina RPE, especially in macular degeneration. Uh, this material that accumulates 
uh, very often between the basement membrane of the RPE and its own, its own plasma or basal uh, plasma membrane. It's called basal lamer deposit. We've shown over the years that it's, it's integrated. It starts as these little clusters integrated into the basal lamina. And then this material can just become huge. And, and actually, I've seen it up to maybe uh, 30 or 40 microns thick. And it really serves to push the RPE off the basal lamina and away from the choriocapillaris. Uh, very often, you'll see this is a, uh, a cult neovascular uh, frond that, that actually grows in this material very often, uh, very ornate material. We don't know, we think it's type 6 collagen. Um, we've shown more recently that it's very much um, directed by chromosome 10 driven macular degeneration associated almost solely with chromosome 10 disease. So interphotoreceptor matrix, anybody know very much about the interphotoreceptor matrix? So, there's not a lot of people that even think about it anymore, so I've spent a long part of my career years ago. But basically, all the space um, between the outer segments and the inner segments of, of the photoreceptor cells is it's filled with a material called inner photoreceptor matrix. Um, probably serves a lot of functions that we don't know of, um, but I think probably most importantly, it probably serves to keep photoreceptor outer segments aligned, um, the so-called Stokes effect. We've never quite understood why they stay perfectly aligned, and it's probably this inner photoreceptor matrix that, that helps to mediate that. Um, certainly, we know that the matrix components are made by both the RPE and photoreceptor cells, um, and there's probably a lot of function here in retinal adhesion um, and maintenance of photoreceptor Viability. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, were there some mutations in that associated with there the delta tau? Oh, okay. You know, I spent my life, so we, we um, describe these two major proteoglycans, IMPG1 and 2. And, you know, it took us, I think, this gene took us almost five years to identify and clone. And today, of course, we could do it up in the lab in a single day, which is really frustrating. But we were actually able to develop a technique to isolate this material from humans. So this is an isolated sheet of IPM. These are where all the cone photoreceptors were sitting. Um, and it depends what you stain. But you can see the very unique structure of this matrix material. Um, so these two major proteoglycans, as far as we know, they're synthesized um, only in the retina. We did a lot of experiments years gone by in monkeys where uh, we were able to show that this matrix really mediates retinal adhesion. So here's a normal monkey uh, interphotoreceptor matrix. And we did a lot of this well with Mike Marmer. We could stretch this material to a huge degree. Um, and we did a lot of experiments and I think proved very convincingly is important for adhesion. And I've always thought um, if you could get back into a retina that was degenerating and maybe get it to synthesize this material again, that we might have some, some hope in, in preserving photoreceptor cells. But I think to your point, there have been um, a number of diseases, maculopathies, that are associated with mutations uh, in these two interphotoreceptor matrix proteoglycans. So that's been fun. We always hoped we would find one of those diseases. And we actually thought North Carolina macular dystrophy would be it, but it turned out it was the gene just next door. So inner retina complex, um, again, we've talked about this photoreceptor layer, right? And it's the outer, comprised the outer nuclear layer. Um, the other two nuclear layers, um, the inner nuclear layer and the ganglion cell layer, I'll talk about kind of as the inner retinal complex. And it's this, this complex that's, that's also vascularized, right? So um, there's, again, I, I think it's, it's simpler if you think about these nuclear layers. So this layer is primarily ganglion cells. This layer you can think of as being, you know, 
80% by color cells, so the cells that directly connect photoreceptors to ganglion cells. Um, but you end up with all these other cells that actually transfer information laterally between adjacent photoreceptors, between um, themselves, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, the inner aspect of, of that layer is, is the inner limiting membrane, which is really nothing more than the basal lamina of the Mueller cells. Okay? So again, another, another basal lamina. And remember, from that outpocketing, this was one layer of the basal surface of the epithelium, right? So this is basal. This is apical, the photoreceptors, when that epithelium folded back on itself, right? So you really have apical to apical, and those are your two original layers of the epithelium. And it's, it's helpful, I think, because that teaches you where these basement membranes sit. So bipolar cells, and I'm not going to bore you with a lot of this. There's a lot of detail. And I, is Helga Cole giving lectures anymore? Not at all. It's too bad. And you guys should tr really try to get her to come. You know, she was such a pioneer in, in a lot, the identification of a lot of these. Bipolar cells, of course, um, primarily convey gradients between the photoreceptor cells and, and the ganglion cell layer. Um, they have presynaptic connections with the rod photoreceptor cells, with cone photoreceptor cells, and with horizontal cells. Okay. Uh, postsynaptic connections, of course, to ganglion cells and amicron cells, which sit primarily down in here. So there's kind of a level one back to it. Horizontal cells really sit, their nuclei sit in the outermost region of the inner nuclear layer, okay? Uh, and they really subserve, primarily subserve um, talking to adjacent um, photoreceptor cells, talking to uh, laterally interconnecting um, with these photoreceptor synapses. Um, they will take input from a lot of photoreceptors, okay, and that's why in the rod system that it's, it's, it's not very, um, very good at fine acuity um, because you have a lot of these being connected by, by a single horizontal cell. You can see this is an antibody we made years ago, and you can kind of see that their their axons uh, really are sit in the outermost portion of the inner nuclear layer. Amicron cells do the opposite; they sit the, on the other border, and they really subserve connections um, between ganglion cells primarily, but also with bipolar cells um, to some degree. And these inner plexiform cells, they actually, um, we don't talk about them a lot, but they connect the two inner plexiform layers and, and again, mediating crosstalk from all that, uh, but primarily take input from amicron cells. Um, and we don't know a lot about their function. Ganglion cells, probably the most complicated. Um, any guesses how many types of ganglion cells there are? I mean, it'll, it, it baffles you when you start thinking about all this structure. But um, like I told you earlier, when you see piled up ganglion cell layer, you always know you're in the macula. Um, and you know there are just numerous morphologies and all kinds of functions. They're on cells, they're off cells, they're on off cells. Um, the, the retina really is an amazing um, structure. I really need science is going on now because we have the ability to isolate single cells in the retina and to do things like RNA sequencing and that has just really, along with morphology, has started teaching us about how many different cell types there are. So I just saw Joshua Sainz the other day and he thinks there's about 30 different um, ganglion cells subtypes and that's all based on kind of a combination of molecular and physiological and morphological data. So he's developing this, this classification. Did you guys all see the talks, David Copenhagen's talks? Fantastic stuff. This whole melanopsin story. So, so you know, subsets of these ganglion cells uh, contain uh, melanopsin. Um, really a fascinating story. 
three types of glial cells in the retina. Um, if you really want to call microglia, microglia, but we will for the, for the sake. Um, Mueller cells, of course, um, they stretch from, from the inner limiting membrane to the outer limiting membrane. Um, they take up probably the largest volume of the inner retina. Um, astrocytes, which are these really cool cells that, that really uh, mediate crosstalk between retinal vasculature and retinal uh, neurons. And the microglia, which are really uh, immune cells, the macrophage-like cells. So astrocytes shown in red, you can really see that they, they, they're talking to each other, but they really um, talk to the vasculature. Um, we think they're not of neuroepithelial origin. We think they migrate in, in early in development. Um, this beautiful picture, you can see that this whole network of astrocytes, and, and they, they wrap around capillaries, they modulate capillary tone. Um, they, they really play an important role. And it's, it's a cell type we don't talk a lot about. Uh, microglial cells are, are sentinels, if you will, almost dendritic cell-like in, in nature. Um, and these cells uh, play all kinds of immunological roles and, and actually are very much associated with, with various uh, immune-mediated dystrophies. And the Mueller cells, have always fascinated me. They, they really do. This was one of my students drew this. These are the, the Mueller cell end feet here. But again, um, the basal lamina, the inner limiting membrane is really the basal lamina of these Mueller cells. And they stretch uh, throughout the retina where they actually project all these microvilli uh, into uh, the subretinal space. And so probably doing a lot of sensing of what's going on transferring that information. Um, very importantly, again, you know, there's a pretty tight border here, um, and that's violated in a lot of diseases, and we'll come back and talk about that some more in the next lecture. But these cells are actually really delicate. They're incredibly sensitive, um, but they function to really maintain homeostasis, ionic homeostasis in the retina. And so, when you see cystic changes in the retina, very often it's mediated by dysfunction of these, of these Mueller cells. We're learning more recently that they actually transport neurotransmitters uh, throughout the retina. And we're not quite sure what all that's about. Um, and of course, you guys will, will think about these cells a lot in the future because of all the, the pathology that they do exhibit. Gliosis following retinal detachments uh, very much participate in formation of epiretinal membranes, uh, fibrovascular membranes in the vitreous. Um, inner retina circulation, um, of course, I think the take home message is there's, there are two layers of capillaries, right? There's a, there's a layer of capillaries in the inner nuclear layer and one in the ganglion cell layer. And a lot of pathology that you'll see, particularly in diabetic retinopathy um, is caused by dysfunction and loss of these capillaries. And we're going to talk more about those uh, in a minute. Lots and lots of aging changes in this inner retina complex, right? Um, uh, lots of ganglion cell death, of course, especially in, in diseases like glaucoma. But uh, can be a lot of intraretinal gliosis, extraretinal gliosis. I think you're familiar with all these but basically, a lot of that is um, Mueller cells gone awry. And the Mueller cell structure, I didn't say, in the fovea, it's one Mueller cell per cone, which is really an interesting phenomenon. So you start losing Mueller cells in the fovea, you start losing the cones one at a time. A lot of pathology, retinoschisis, is one of the diseases you'll probably see most um, obviously uh, in, in your clinic practice that involves the inner retina. Not common, but um, I sit on a couple of scientific advisory boards, so this is a huge target for gene therapy approaches right now. Um, and I think there's about three trials that are about to start in retinal species uh, using gene therapy. Lots of vascular disease. We're going to talk more about vascular disease um, next time. 
course you're opting neuropathies and, and just general aging changes in that interrenal complex. And of course a lot of retinovascular pathological changes and again we're going to talk about and break those down a little bit. But um, kind of in my way of thinking there are diseases that relate to breakdown of that blood retinal barrier, right? Glaucoma or um, diabetic retinopathy, macular edema being, being two of the large diseases. Um, lots of diseases that involve various types of aneurysms of those, and then of course all the occlusive and ischemic diseases, and we'll look at those in more detail. So I think we're probably can think about ending, but talk about retinal um, pathology. Tell me about these retinals. I mean, you got the last one. Some kind of uh, RP like retinitis pigmentosa like thing. Okay. It doesn't quite look like it though. Tell me what you're seeing. Uh, the nerves are pale. I don't see any blood vessels. That that's the nerve. Yeah. So, and I don't. What's that? Is that a blood vessel? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I'm not a very nice guy. <laughs> um, this is one of the moons of Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun. Okay. There it is. The moon Europa. Oh, Jupiter. Sorry. I saw that in Time Magazine and I had to do it. <laughs> so I think we'll stop there. It's probably a good stopping point. And then um, in early May, I think it's May 8th, we'll come back and I'm the vitreous and the choroid, and use macular degeneration kind of to show you good examples of, of changes in the pathology. So any questions? Okay. Too tired? <laughs> so I welcome all of you to, if you haven't dropped by the CTM you know, any time, just feel free. Eileen spent some time in on it. Um, we're we have, I don't, Jean Dewan and, um, do you know Jean? Jean Dewan, really famous retina guy that invented translocation surgery. He's been coming out a lot, so the, the chromosome 1 and 10 data are really coming out nicely, and I think. Um, Andy Shackett and Jean and Anat Lowenstein from Israel, they're another very famous retina person. They're probably going to be coming out a lot, so it'd be great if we could get you all together with them when they do visit. Yeah, they could talk at Grand Rounds. You probably we could do that. It'd yeah. be fun for you to hear from some yeah. of those people. So, um, but drop by anytime. We'd love to show you what we're doing. Um, that's Thank it. you for watching us. Oh, you're